them even this afternoon. We pray thy blessing upon them. We pray, Father, for all of those that uh, travel these streets around the hall and walk by the, the building here. Many every day coming to and from work uh, walk right past this building. We pray that their interest might be stirred to come in and hear the word of God. So we pray thy blessing and commend ourselves to thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'd like you to turn your Bibles, please, to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first that there shall come in the last days, scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I believe verse 9 gives us a real insight into the heart of God. Not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. That is really the beneficent love of God that goes out to the whole world. That is the love that is illustrated so beautifully in the verse above me in John chapter three and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God has a love for this world he has a love for every single individual that was ever born into this world. It is a, a, a love that embraces the whole world of humanity, not the world of rocks and rivers and trees that's being spoken of in John 3 and 16. It's the world of humanity. God has a heart of love toward humanity. But of course, what has happened to humanity? What is the condition of humanity tonight? We see all around us the evidence of decay and corruption and a turning away from that which is true, that which is holy, that which has been revealed to us by the word of God, a world that is trampling underfoot sacred things and have turned their hearts to the profane. I was thinking of what it says here in verse four, when they question the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course we know that the Bible is full of, of prophecy. Uh, a major part of divine revelation in this book we call the Bible is made up of prophetic utterances. The Old Testament, uh, verses, if you count them, I'm taking this from something I read. I never actually uh, got the calculator out and, and did any math, uh, but they tell me that there are 23,210 Old Testament verses. 28.5% of 
of those verses from the Old Testament are prophetic. They speak of future events. They're predictive in their nature. Of the New Testament verses, 7,914 New Testament verses, 1,711 of them are prophetic, 21.5%. That tells me that God places a very high premium on prophecy, on what he says about the future. He wants us to know what the future holds. 27%, if you calculate it out, fully 27% of our Bible speaks of future events. 737 uh, separate prophetic topics are covered in the Word of God. 333 of those are concerning the Lord Jesus Christ specifically. 333 prophecies that speak specifically of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many do you think of those have already been fulfilled? 107. In connection with his first coming, 224 are yet to be fulfilled that speak of his second coming. Now, if anybody did some quick math, which I just did in my head, I believe I'm out by two there. It's 109, not 107, that speak uh, of the Lord Jesus' first coming. And 224 of, the, of those remaining prophecies speak of his second coming. That hasn't happened yet. That is yet future. But do you know what gives me great confidence? Well, number one, when I think about it, I am in such admiration of the Old Testament saints that just believed God in connection with all of the prophecies about his first coming. There were those who were waiting and longing for their Messiah to appear. And when he did, they recognized him. That's a subject for another, another gospel message. But when he arrived and it became obvious to them, they glorified God. They were so thankful that all of those uh, Old Testament prophecies uh, concerning his coming to the earth, 109 of them to be exact, they were all going to be fulfilled. Well, we have that in, in our history. We know that they already took place. We have the advantage over the Old Testament saints in that we can look back and see how God fulfilled all of those prophet, prophecies right to the letter. Nothing was embellished. There was no adding to it or taking away from it. They were all fulfilled specifically. You know what? What that speaks to my heart? That all of the remaining prophecies about his second coming are going to be fulfilled exactly the same way. Precisely. Nothing's going to be left out. Everything that my Bible says about the second coming, which was actually spoken about more than his first coming, God is going to fulfill every one of them. And so when they ask this question, where is the, uh, the, the promise of his coming? Where is the promise of his coming? The answer is very simple. Of course, they, they have closed their minds to it. They have shut the door of their mind on the simple, plain answer. Where is the promise of his coming? From Genesis to Revelation in the Bible. All of the prophecies concerning the coming 224 of them that have yet to be fulfilled concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. It's right here in the Bible. Did you ever think about looking them up? Did you ever think about reading them? Finding out what God says? The proof is there. And yet they sit back and scoff. Where is the promise of his coming? 
And they say, for since the fathers fell asleep, they try to go back in history. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, Bible scholars tell me that when it speaks here of the creation, they're not talking about uh, the creation of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They're just talking about uh, from the beginnings. It's not God's creation that they're focused on at all. And we live in a day and age where our children are being taught in the schools. Now, right from the time they enter school, their minds are being filled with the poison of evolution. Evolution is being presented like a god. I'm going to back that up because I've listened to some of them. I studied it in university. I did a minor in biology, which uh, uh, an expert does not make me at all. <laughs> Eight courses in biology. No big deal, but every course was full of evolution from beginning to end. I remember sitting in a botany class in a lab once, and we were poring over our microscopes, myself and my uh, fellow students. There was one guy in the class. He was a really bright student, intelligent guy, uh, very vocal, and uh, he would be talking to the professor all the time. And I wasn't like that. I was, I was quieter. Uh, but uh, we got uh, talking back and forth in the lab this day, and something came up about evolution, and he started waxing eloquent about uh, evolutionary processes. And, and I just made a very quiet statement. Well, you know, I, I really believe in the, in the creation as it's taught in the Bible. God created the heavens and the earth. And I can see the look that came over his face. Now, this was back in like 1974, probably, 1975. The look that came over his face, he just stared at me and his mouth kind of dropped. And he said, I didn't know there was anybody left that still believed that. I didn't know there was anybody left that still believed that. And he said it with a, a measure of scorn. Well, I had to try to make it clear to him that there are a lot of us that believe God created the heavens and the earth. And I tried to explain to him in simple terms that we weren't as far out there as he thought we were. And after a few minutes discussion, I began to turn it right back upon him. The things, the unbelievable things that he has to believe in order to be an evolutionist. I listened to a program not too long ago. He was on CBC radio driving along. And this uh, individual came on. It was a lady. She was hosting a, a show on evolution that became very popular down through the States. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the name of it. Uh, because uh, right in the very name of that show uh, was a word that you would not repeat. It was an obscenity. So that, of course, tells you right there the mindset. They had an obscenity right in the title of the show. But it was all about evolution. Evolution was in the title as well. And this uh, uh, woman, obviously highly educated, highly intelligent and very articulate. And the way she uh, would explain herself and just go from one evolutionary process uh, to the other. And she kept saying over and over all of these amazing things that, that, that evolution has, has done and evolution has accomplished. And look what evolution has done here. And she talked about all of these things that evolution has done. And before she was finished, it became so obvious to me. She was worshiping at the altar of evolution. She was ascribing powers to evolution to control all of these forces to bring about the diversity of life that we see all around us in the world. And it just struck me. Like the old saying goes, the number of unbelievable things, unbelievers, have to believe in order to be unbelievers. I hope you got that. Bit of a tongue twister. 
But it's true. I, I think of the, the human eye. And with what little I, I studied in university, it was enough to get a little grasp on these processes. I've often thought the human eye, and not only human eye, but the eyes of all the animal creation. How did that ever evolve? And I studied it those four years in university. And it still left me just in a state of total unbelief as regards evolution. Absolutely no way. The odds are just astronomical to the point where it's not even worth considering that that could ever happen by chance. And that's just one human organ. We're not talking about all of the rest of them that have to work in, in perfect harmony in order for me to stand here tonight and try to preach the gospel. No, we believe God created every single person, every one of us here, that he loved us and that he showered upon us blessing after blessing. Why did he do it? Why has God sustained us and brought us to this place even tonight where we can hear the word of God. He knew from his beginning of creation what humanity would do. And yet in spite of that, in spite of man's rebellion and turning against him and all of the hard speeches that men and women speak against God, I often wonder, were it not for the love and mercy of God, every one of us would have been struck down long ago. We might not, some of us might not say things with our lips, but there's enough that's gone on in our minds to prove how rebellious we are. But in his love and mercy, he provided a way back to God, a way back to himself, a plan that was so interesting and engaging, no human being would ever have thought of it. That's why they mock it so much. I listened to another atheist, a man by the name of Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, talking about the crucifixion one day and just mocking and scoffing how anybody could come up uh, with this so-called plan where uh, God would become a man and end up on a cross. And he, his language just dripped with sarcasm. And I thought to myself, this highly intelligent man doesn't know as much as some of these young children in our meeting tonight who have come to understand that God sent his son to pay the price for sin in order that I might be saved. That's why we love to, uh, to fill the minds of our children and our young people with the truth of scripture. They are being bombarded every day in the school systems of our world. And if it's not there, it's on the playground or with the neighbors, uh, neighboring children uh, that know not the truth of God. That's why they need to be uh, solidly grounded in what the Bible says and understand the truth of that hymn, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. I was at Bill Metcalf's funeral. One of our preachers, Mr. Steers here had several gospel series with him years ago. He was a, a mentor of mine. He gave me some good godly advice and counsel when I was just a teenager, which I appreciated. I wanted to be at the funeral. And so I went and one of the hymns that he requested was that very hymn, Jesus loves me, this I know. And there I thought there's a man in his early eighties and uh, approaching death and preparing for that time uh, when he was gonna meet his Lord and savior. And he wanted to have that children's hymn sang at his funeral. And I'll tell you, that spoke to my heart. It brought tears to my eyes when we were singing it. Looking at that casket at the front of the hall there in Sarnia. Because it just brings you right back to the simplicity of the gospel that we preach. Jesus loves me. This I know. When I read this verse, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. God is not like us. 
He's, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And he's long suffering to this ungodly world. Where is the promise of his coming? The scoffers say. I'd like to point out to any that question it in that way. I'd like to point out to them. I hope you understand that it is the mere mercy, goodness, and love of God that stays his hand of judgment right now from falling upon this world. Were it not from that for that, I am sure that we would have all been swept out into eternity. But he withholds. He waits. One of the things that I believe God is watching tonight is activity just like this in Rexdale Gospel Hall. What's going to happen in West Hill in a week's time? And other places that are planning like efforts in the gospel. That's why I love to, uh, to try to speak about it wherever I go amongst the assemblies. Try to stir up the brethren and sisters. Try to get us at uh, this great work of spreading the gospel. Because I believe uh, that the spirit of God working through the church, working through his people is, is what restrains this world from wholesale wickedness. Were it not for Christians and our influence this world would be far worse than it is tonight. Wouldn't be fit to live in it. Scarcely is now. That's why when the rapture takes place and the Christians are swept into the presence of the Lord Jesus, the floodgates are going to open on this world. The floodgates of evil and wickedness are going to sweep over this world. A man will rise up called the man of sin, the Antichrist. The whole world is going to be steeped in wickedness. And were it not, again, for the grace and mercy and love of God, right then and there, what we could read later on in this chapter would take place. The elements would just melt with fervent heat. But God has a program. God has a plan. Things are going to happen first. Before that great and final day takes place. Why? Because God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And what really strikes me whenever I study Bible prophecy and, and study what's going to happen after the Lord comes and the, and the church is raptured home, and those that are left behind have to face the, uh, the horrific uh, events that are going to unfold and envelop the whole world. What amazes me, in the midst of all of that, souls are still going to be getting saved. Still, Souls are still going to be turning to Christ for salvation. Now, they will just be a few. When I say a few, a population of, what, 7 billion now in the world? You can check Google for that. A few million would just be a few, wouldn't it? Considering 7 billion. Perhaps even a few million might come to Christ for salvation during the tribulation. That would be an amazing thing, wouldn't it? God is still going to work. And here's my concern as I sit down tonight. What about you in this meeting? Are you among those who have come to Christ, bowed your knee, cried to him for salvation, just laid hold upon the great fact that Christ died for me. And I am willing to stake my eternal salvation on that simple truth. Christ for me. He died for me. Is that your desire tonight? My prayer, my desire is that as this meeting continues, we might get that matter settled once and for all. Read of the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> the 
chapter 15. Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Just very briefly along the lines of what my brother has been speaking, I picked up a book some time ago, written by a Christian doctor. And he is describing in that book, step by step, every step that must take place from the moment of conception until the moment of birth. Stunning thing. Every single birth that takes place in this world must follow that pattern that God has established step by step. Evolution could never, never do that. I'm going to read with you in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And we'll read from verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man, they are referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They said that in criticism, but the statement was true. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. Now notice verse 7 particularly. I say unto you, now this is the Lord Jesus now speaking. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. That one sinner that repents is illustrated by one lost sheep. So the purpose that the Lord had in telling this account to those who are listening. Verse 7 again. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And that's all that I'm going to read, but when you follow on the chapter, and this is a tremendous chapter because we have a whole chapter in which the Lord Jesus is preaching the gospel. That makes this chapter stand out very uniquely, very special, because we hear the Savior himself preaching the gospel and he's using three illustrations. I've only read one of them. The illustration of a lost sheep, but he'll use the illustration of a lost piece of silver. He'll use another illustration of a lost son. And so he is presenting the truth of the gospel very clearly here in Luke chapter 15. And so when you come to the sheep, the 90 and 9 sheep represent scribes and Pharisees which need no repentance. That is, they don't know what it is to repent. Repentance is not in their experience. They're not prepared to consider the fact of their sin. That's the 90 and 9. The 90 and 9 in Luke's account <coughs> never reached the shepherd's fold. But we have one sheep, and that one sheep represents publicans and sinners. Publicans and sinners understand their need. They know their need and the savior is using the illustration here the one sheep to represent the publicans and sinners that the shepherd goes out and he finds so we have the account here of the one sheep heaven is interested here in fact all heaven is interested in your soul tonight the believers are interested 
and concerned about your soul. That's why a number of men would gather down the stairs to pray before this meeting. There are names mentioned in that prayer meeting. Names perhaps of some that are sitting here tonight. Because Christians are interested, are concerned, are exercised about your soul. But Luke chapter 15 takes me to a far higher level. Luke chapter 15 tells me that the shepherd represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And reminds me of the interest that the Savior has in your soul. If I was to read further concerning the lost piece of silver and the woman lighting a candle and beginning to search for the piece of silver represents the work of the Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit is interested in your soul tonight. And when I come to the Father, receiving the Son back from the far country, the Father speaks of God. All heaven is interested in this meeting tonight. That's why when we stand here to speak, we take this to be a very serious thing. That is, we're not just here to practice a speech. We're here because this is serious. This is solemn tonight. When we remember and when we consider that all of heaven eyes are upon this gathering tonight. The eyes of heaven are upon you. Lost sheep, one lost piece of silver, one lost son. Maybe I should just point out just very briefly that the account that is given in Matthew chapter 18 and the account in Luke chapter 15 are not the same account. When you come to Matthew chapter 18, the Lord is speaking very specifically to his disciples. Here, he's speaking to publicans and sinners, scribes and Pharisees. When you come to Matthew chapter 18, uh, the Lord speaks about the, the sheep and the 99. And the 99 in Matthew chapter 18 are different than the 99 here. The 99 in Matthew chapter 18 are not said the same as these are. Here, they have gone astray. The guy in Matthew chapter 18 says, if so be that he find it. In other words, in Matthew chapter 18, he may not find it. If so be that he find it. But here, he finds it. The shepherd was searching or lost sheep, one lost sheep. You will notice here that three times the sheep is said to be lost. Notice that that says said in verse four twice and is said here in verse six once. A lost sheep, lost. So, lost. Do you realize tonight that the word of God would remind you that in your sins, you are lost. And how many have, and perhaps some that I'm speaking to, that are saved tonight, but when they look back and discover they were lost, and their testimony would be, I couldn't find a way, lost. When a person gets to the point where they discover that they are lost and in their sins, we're kind of thankful for that. You might say, well, that's not a very kind thing to say, but we are very, very thankful. When a sinner gets to the place that they understand that they are lost, because they're not very far from salvation, when they realize that when the truth has gripped their soul, I am lost in my sins. I can't find a way. There are many who sense that they were, are lost. And they have struggled with that. And they've tried to understand the gospel. And they can't understand it. And they can't, they can't grasp how a person can know for sure that they are saved. And they wrestle with that. And they're under the conviction of sin. And they're having a difficult time because they are lost. One man asked the question, what should I do to be saved? And the preacher said, get lost. 
Find out that you are in your sin, wandering on to eternity, lost. And so the sheep here is said to be lost. That's the nature of the animal. Interesting that the Lord Jesus used the sheep to emphasize the word lost. I've seen sheep wandering beside the road in Newfoundland. And I asked the brother who was driving the car, where are those sheep from? He said, well, I don't know. And they likely don't know because they're lost. A dog has something about it, something about its instinct, something that's part of the animal that can find the way home. And so young people, all of us, perhaps have read the book, Lassie, come home. The animal dog got home. But that's not a sheep. A sheep can't find the way. And when the sheep is lost, it doesn't know where it is. And it doesn't have that instinct to find the way. And so the Lord Jesus here used a lost sheep that can't find the way to illustrate a lost sinner wanting to be saved but can't understand the gospel, can't find the way, and the truth doesn't seem to open up to their understanding. And they acknowledge that they're lost. I have had some people going out of a gospel meeting and they almost cried, I'm lost. And I said, thank God. Because that means they won't be very long lost before they get saved. And so here's the sheep. Where is it lost? It's lost in the wilderness. We mentioned this morning and it's been mentioned already that, that the problems of being lost in the wilderness, an animal, the sheep lost, it's subject to the prey of other animals and all of the difficulties in the wilderness, the world that we are living in. It's in a house in Thunder Bay. And the man where I stayed had sheep. And I remember watching him going out late in the evening and bringing the sheep into the barn, the sheep fold. And when they would come into the barn, he would count them, each one that would enter the door of the sheep fold. And then one night, one sheep was missing. I watched, I'm in an upstairs bedroom. I watched him and his daughter with their flashlights going out across the big field, looking for the lost sheep. They found it. They found the body. The wolf had got the sheep. The wolf is not interested in eating the sheep. The wolf is only interested in killing the sheep. That's the awful violence of the world that we are living in. The world is not interested in your soul. The world that you rub shoulders with every day has no concern where you're going to spend eternity. You ought to be very thankful tonight that heaven does have an interest in your soul. Sheep is lost, helpless, can't defend itself. Nothing I can do. I think I told you one night about the woman who said, I'm lost and there's nothing I can do about it. A lost sheep needs someone to search for it and someone to rescue it. So the sheep is hopelessly lost. I have told you about the little track that I read one day. Two boys standing on the street corner. I think the city was Chicago. The older boy is crying. The boys are not very old. The younger boy, he's looking around and looking at the traffic, looking at the tall buildings, watching the people go by. The policeman leaned over to the older boy and asked him what the problem was. The older boy said to the policeman, I'm lost and I can't find the way home. And the policeman said, well, what about this boy? He's not crying. The older boy said, he's my brother. He's lost too, but he doesn't know it. Do you know it? Has it ever gone upon your soul that I'm just like the sheep, I'm lost? And has it ever been real to you to understand that you are? That you're on the broad road on the chart that is behind me, going on to eternity, lost and in your sins and no hope for heaven. 
no savior. And it's never really so in your soul. Here, notice verse two. I do your attention to it. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And while the passage emphasizes over and over, not only the lost sheep, the lost silver, and the lost son, but it gives us right at the beginning of the passage the grand truth to meet the need of those who are lost. That is, the Lord Jesus receives sinners. That's what he's doing tonight. We are getting very near to the end of the day of grace. Some will remember the chart that we had up behind me on the book of Daniel. My brother has been referring to prophetic scripture. It was a stunning thing. And I hope that the impression was made upon everyone. An astounding thing that Daniel in captivity in Babylon could look down the corridors of time hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and make prophetic statements. Some of them have been fulfilled exactly as Daniel said. Others are still waiting to be fulfilled. What a book, this Bible. And so here we have the sheep lost. Let me ask you again. Heaven is interested in you tonight. Younger people, mothers and father, you be thankful for that. Because there are younger people in this world that their mothers and fathers aren't the least bit concerned with them. The prevalent school teachers, so it are. And I have looked into the faces of young people. And I can read in their face that they come from a home where mothers and fathers simply don't care. We can be thankful that you do have parents that care. And that are interested in your soul. And that want to see you sitting in a gospel meeting. I'm thankful that my parents care. Sometimes when I could come up with a pretty good excuse and told my parents that I didn't feel very well. Maybe I was kind of lying a bit there because I would be allowed to stay home for one day. And if I was allowed to stay home, my normal sleeping place was in the bedroom upstairs, but in the bedroom downstairs, my bedroom, my parents would allow me to stay in that bedroom if I stayed home. So if I could stay home for a day, I got to stay in that bedroom. But there was something in that bedroom that really bothered me. On the wall, there was one of the little texts that sometimes are given out in Sunday school with a picture. And the picture was of a shepherd. A sheep had fallen over a crevice and was way down the crevice in the hanging or, or clinging to the, to the roots of the trees that grew out of the crevice. And it showed the shepherd. The shepherd has started to climb down to rescue the sheep. And it showed the legs of the shepherd cut and bruised and bleeding in order to rescue a lost sheep. And I didn't need someone to explain to me that that really was a picture of the Lord Jesus as the shepherd and what he suffered on a cross at Calvary that he might rescue lost sheep. The sufferings of the Lord Jesus are far beyond human tongue to tell. Oh, he's sometimes saying the love that Jesus had for me to suffer on a cruel tree that I ransom so like be is more than tongue can tell. Sometimes I'm sure my brother would say the same thing. We feel a little frustrated when we're preaching. Because we, we want to set the Lord Jesus as the Savior of sinners before sinners. And we feel that we, we, we don't go the way we would like to. I would like to tell you tonight that there's a man in heaven who loved you more than anyone ever 
good on this earth. Loved you more than grandparents. Loved you far more than even your own mother and father. And his love was so great that he would sacrifice his life, that his precious blood would be shed at Calvary. We're singing of Calvary tonight. The only time once that the word appears in the word of God in Luke's gospel here, Calvary where the Lord Jesus suffered and where he died. What does Calvary mean to you? When the Lord Jesus is speaking about the sheep and the shepherd going after the sheep, he's speaking about himself and he's telling what he will do to rescue lost sinners to save them. I have meetings in a place called Crispin Sits. If you come from New Brunswick or from that part of Canada, Chris Francis probably is easy for you to say. It took me a while to get my tongue around that word. Chris Francis. There's a young woman attending those meetings. When I say young, I can only guess. I guess she was 17. One night, she went home from the meeting. She had something in her dresser drawer that meant a lot to her. There was a rock concert coming to St. John's New Brunswick. That's very rare in New Brunswick. And she was able somehow, and likely her parents didn't know, that she had got two tickets to that rock concert. She intended to go to the concert with her boyfriend. They came home from the tent one night, went up to her bedroom, opened her dresser drawer. She had hid those tickets underneath the clothes in her dresser drawer. I know this because she told us a story. And she took the two tickets out, two tickets to a rock concert. That's where her heart was set. She wanted to go to that concert, but there were tent meetings on it. And she had heard, she knew, she was raised under the sound of the gospel, that this was an opportunity for her to be saved. So after the meeting in the tent, she went home and she took the two tickets out. And she held them in her hands and she looked at that's where she wanted to go. That's where she longed to be at a rock concert. She thought about her soul. She had heard in the tent that this was the accepted time. This was the opportunity to be saved. And Michelle was looking at the rock concert tickets and she's thinking about the tent meetings, and she's thinking about her soul, and quietly in that bedroom, she's doing something that you should do. She's counting the cost. She's counting what it might cost her if she went to the rock concert, and in the end, lost her soul and never got saved. Am I speaking to someone tonight, and have you ever sat down for a moment and counted the cost. That night in that bedroom, Michelle took those tickets and she ripped them in half. She counted the cost. She went to the tent meeting the next night and early the next morning, there's a phone call. She's having a meeting with Brother Bernard McCallis. I think my wife was in the house but I think where he came up the steps for a time. Come, we've got to go. We took a little trip and sat down with Michelle in a Tim Hortons. And that's when she told us a story. Did it come with cost? Have you just sat down quietly for a moment of time and just considered? This is life on one side. 
Here's all the things, maybe like Michelle, that you want to do. All the things that you have planned. But on the other side, here's my soul. And my soul is going to be for eternity in heaven or in hell. And I made the statement that I'm thankful when I hear someone say I'm lost because I believe we're getting very close to counting the cost. If my soul should be lost, how? Why is it now? Here's a sheep that found itself on the shoulders of the shepherd. And the poor little feet of that sheep never touched the earth again. On the shoulders of the shepherd, rescued by the shepherd. That's what the Lord Jesus wants to do tonight. That's what I said. All heaven is interested in your soul tonight. Of course. Our Father in our Savior's name, we have heard tonight of the folly and foolishness of man who claim to be intelligent and you stumble over what simple believers believe the Bible and the word of God and the message of salvation that we would seek to present tonight we pray that there would be soul or souls here who would come to cost my soul should be lost bless thy word we pray as we give thanks in our Savior's name I'm going to sing him number 194. 194. Sometimes the time is up, but I think you'll sing the word. I'll just read the chorus. When you come to the cause, if your soul should be lost, when you gain the whole world for your own. Even now, it may be that the line you cross as you come and become a cross. What have we done? There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord. Where the cause of this spirit is lost, and you hurry along with the pleasure that strong. Have you counted? Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost in your soul? Thank uh -huh. 